Cool. All right, so today's is, is going to be a little bit different. Um, the, uh, the, and, and today's is the moon. Um, but the, the primary source that I've been using for the tarot is Sally Nichols, um, got it here, Tarot and the Archetypal Journey. Um, and for this particular tarot card, uh, she said that she didn't find, you know, she did all this research on the crayfish, dogs, towers, and moons, and nothing seemed to put her in touch. So instead, she decides to do an act of imagination on the symbols. And I found the act of imagination that she did so moving that, you know, instead of giving you, you know, like the Shams outline of, of her material, I decided I'm just going to read her uh, act of imagination on the symbols. Um, and it's, you know, and it's kind of interesting too, in that, you know, the, the, the book we've been doing, The Living Symbol, and it's, you know, Jungian approach. Uh, we have symbols, images, and we search for connections between the, you know, and the, the collective unconscious and the implied message from our, from our dream makers. So to me, you know, these, these tarot cards, these are like, you know, they're like from the unconscious and, and you know, and you can work with them just like you work with a dream. So this is this is her act of imagination that she does uh, on this card. This is the dark of the moon, a time of mystery, wonder, and terror. The witching hour when Hectate haunts the crossroads and her hounds stand guard, baying. No god or human being is seen. We are lost even to ourselves. Deep in the waters lurks a crawfish with claws outspread. Do we dare go forward or will this monstrous creature reach out to pull us back? The moon looks down on all, silent. Whose mask is that she wears? Maybe it's the fool's, for she wears a band of rainbow colors not unlike those of our jester, reminding us that the moon is concerned with man's welfare. At dawn, she will cry her moon's tears with magic powers to nourish and heal. The moon goddess of the terrible night is also the giver of dreams, the revealer of hidden mysteries. Is the crawfish really our enemy or is it too struggling toward the distant towers? How like death's skeleton it looks. It wears its bones on the outside like armor to protect the mummy flesh within from change. And with what monstrous success, this crawfish, like the Egyptian scarab, is exactly like the same creature as its great, great, great ancestor some 10 millenniums ago. Like the scarab, it is immortal. See now how its truth glows darkly under the phosphorescent moon, a revelation. Now terror is dissolved in awe. The creature no longer seems menacing. Like a fly immobilized in amber, it stands impaled against the blue water. Emblazoned there like the eagle on the royal shield, Scorpio rising. Her claws reach up to embrace the moon, the ever-changing, changeless moon. Upright, she salutes the man on the moon. Lamat. God's little friend and ours. And now at last the hounds are quiet. Their bloodthirst will soon be slaked by the moon's tears. The crawfish offers his back for our step. Come friends, take hands, take heart. It is now or forever. Forward, let us dare die. The moon smiles now and fades out of the picture. His work is done. In the dark of the moon, the sun is preparing himself to rise. So that was that was her active imagination on this, and, and you know it's just you know I love the feeling and the emotion and the you know the poetic sense that that came from this, and I, I and I you know and I, in truth I think this is how the the tarot was really meant uh, to be connected with, and and so you know and then she does her standard thing and you. You know, you have her chapter, which is like, you know, 20 or 30 pages long, 
which is really, uh, you know, an amplification of the act of imagination. But, uh, you know, for me, the, the act of imagination, you know, I just, the, the emotion that I just really liked it. Um, and, and, you know, and again, you know, what's really doubly fascinating about this is that we, you know, we have to remember these tarot cards were created by artists and, you know, the symbols were eventually used for divination uh, by the 1700s. But, you know, and I tried to find the artists that, you know, created the original cards and there's just nobody knows, you know, it's just, there's, there's just no information out there. So I wanted to, there's one other act of imagination that I wanted to read. And that's, um, uh, and it's out of this book, Tarot for Yourself. And what this book does is, uh, you know, it tells you how to do the tarot cards if you're going to do readings for yourself. And, you know, and, and, and it's a really good book, you know, I really like it, you know, but, you know, she, she gives rituals and things to go through to kind of, you know, get in the proper state, because I, you know, even if, even if you're going to do an act of imagination, you know, you've got, you have to be in the proper state. And I think it really helps to do, you know, a bit of ritual before you actually do it. So she, you know, in, in, you know, one of the, one of the exercises she has where you take, uh, you know, three tarot cards and then you create a narrative around it. Um, you know, she gives this example of what one of her students did with the fool, the magician and the high priestess. And so I'm gonna read, uh, you know, the act of imagination, which the student did with these three. And actually, I'm only going to read a part of it because it went on for for quite a while. And, and the thing that the thing that really struck me about this is I'm reading this and I'm thinking, like, oh my gosh, you know, this is, you know, it's it's not to the depth of like what Young got in the Red Book, but you can, but you know, it, it feels like that type of path, like, you know, like she was involved to that extent. Um, so here's, here's a section. And remember, this is a narrative that tries to tie them together. And, and I'm just going to, you know, I'll read the part that's the fool and the magician. Those are the only two that we'll get to. The garden surrounding the temple is one beyond description. You have been led here by a colorful character with a carefree way about him. His absorption with the world around him makes you feel a bit uneasy. If it weren't for you and this little white dog, he would have fallen into many mishaps. You have to be very aware of where you are in order to follow him. His seeming lack of reality leads you to believe he is out of it. As you climb and jump from cliff to goal, you begin to become lightheaded. Stopping to catch your breath, you see him disappear into a rose garden. When you return to your senses, a new awareness comes over you. So this is the switch to the magician. You feel as though a transformation has taken place. An incredible energy force is beckoning through the rose bush. You move through the hanging vines. On the other side is the garden. In the distance, the temple. Entering this wondrous oasis, you are struck by the intensity of around you. On your left, is a square wooden table. In front of the table stands a man whose beauty takes your breath. He seems to be leading an invisible sympathy as he raises the baton in his right hand and directs the energy in his left hand. Electricity shoots from every inch of his being. On the table before him are a cup, a rod, a sword, and what seems to be a giant coin with a star in the middle. He seems somehow familiar to you, as if in a dream you had followed him here. You ask him for his name. He looks at you and winks. It seems he is playing tricks with your mind. Visions and fantasies dance between you, and yet each one is beyond mere hallucination. With each new thought picture presented to you comes a clarity and awareness that you've never known before. It's all you can do to keep up with him. 
so that's the that's the act of imagination you know part of it that her uh, her student did um so those are the ones that that i wanted to do but you know just on on kind of a whim you know it, all this sort of reminded me of, of and this book is it, this is all pretty old but this one book rogers the Lasney, in there you know he the it, it's a fantasy but in there you know like they'll they need to travel to a place which actually isn't in this world and the way they get there is they will get on their horses and then slowly with their minds they'll begin to change just little parts of the landscape that they're riding through and eventually you know it's it's you know over like the period of a day they will have moved to this to this other place and i thought oh my gosh you know it really makes me wonder you know if uh Salazny was actually quite familiar with Young, and it's like, you know, I just if if you if you like that type of thing, um, you know, I would recommend this book as well. But that's that's what I have for today, and uh, you know, and I think, you know, and, and for me, this may mean a bit of a change in direction too, you know, and I've and I'm going to, um, uh, you know, put that the the paper that I've got out there. You know, which is kind of like I said, the Shams outline of that book. And of course, the book is much better. But in truth, you know, I almost think what I'm going to be doing now is I'm going to maybe start at the beginning again. This is just for myself and try to do active imaginations on each tarot so that, like, you know, what I have right now is probably, you know, a couple pages per. But I think with the active imagination, it will shorten it down, you know, to probably like a page, and yet it'll be better at containing the essence and also fit into being more of a story. And I think we remember things through stories. And so I think that's actually, uh, you know, a more effective way to, uh, to, to relate. Um, so that's, that's today's. It's all yours, Craig. Okay, well, thank you very much, Gary. That was wonderful. You know, there is a Tao of the moment, you know, when you uh, throw an I Ching and there's a Tao of the moment when you get a Tarot card. And uh, uh, there is, all, uh, if you can uh, get the symbolic uh, or symbolic uh, side to, uh, uh, to comment on the Tao of this moment, it's in, in active imagination it's it's very helpful that you know aline when we were talking about the the personality number two it, you know you know what it really is it's the symbolic uh personality the personality that lives in with sim in the symbol uh universe you know and is informed by it constantly i mean this was what bon, uh, jeffrey raff said about von franz is that she would do this all the time and I just want to welcome uh, Susan. It's great to see you. I've I've been, uh, uh, you know, uh, communicating with you by, from afar, but it's great to see you today. Thank you. Susan is a student. Uh, I think you're already a therapist, but you're you're studying Jungian uh, psychology. Yeah, I'm in an analyst training. Um, yes, in analyst training. Yeah, uh, and uh, great to see you. She's, thank you. Uh, great to be here. I've been watching you guys. Yeah. Well, and we're going to go back to the uh, feminine in fairy tales. We'll find a good one, you know, but um, uh, just I, I think the whole aspect of that is that it's, uh, um, first of all, it's incredibly instructive and it's incredibly profound, you know, and so we can apply it to our, uh, our own uh, life. Uh, I mean, our own symbolic life. You know, I'm uh, I think, you, you know, the, the, this universe that we're entering here is so mysterious. I want to, you know, my wife always has these unbelievably mysterious things. I, and I want to say hi to Kevin and Angelique and Ken Dream and Camilla and Azine and uh, uh, Tim. And I saw uh, Angelique, uh, you look like you're actually outside in Greece right now. It's just beautiful. That little, the wonderful lighting. But um, 
you you know uh let me see if i can get this up here uh yeah this this is just it, one of the things i think that you're doing gary and, and i just wanted to read it this is from von franz about uh uh the japanese experience of of uh or the timeless experience of the no and you know this is this is really i think what we're trying to do here uh let me see if I can get it up here. It's just a, sort of a good introduction to uh, what what we're going to be doing here. Let's see if I can get it up. Yeah, here it is. Okay. It's just, uh, you know what uh, the no is? I'm sure you've seen it. You know, it's this uh, wonderful Japanese theater that there is, but she's just describing it anyone lending himself to the timeless experience of the no never forgets it. The no explores time and space in ways unfamiliar to our Western aesthetic, the eerie use of the human voice in which normal breathing has been artfully suppressed, the occasional long drawn, sad and solitary notes of a flute the periodic sharp cries and cat-like yowls from the chorus, the abrupt clack of the sticks and the varied tonality of the three kinds of drum and the gliding ghostly dancers, the sudden summoning stamp on the bare resonant stage where every property has been abstracted to a mere symbol, the extravagant and the lavish costumes the unreal reality of the wooden masks worn by the participants, and above all, the artful use of emptiness and silence. No words in this thing. It's just uh, so beautiful. And and uh, uh, another uh, thing I, I want uh, to show uh, one to time about this this mysterious enterprise that we're on. You know, this is from the vision seminar. I wish we'd do this sometime, but you know, it's 1600 pages. <laughs> the un that the unconscious is blind, that it does not see is in its definition. If the unconscious could see, there would be no unconscious and we would be entirely superfluous. You know, blindness is very often the quality of the seer, for when his eyes look to the world, uh, when his eyes to the world are blind, they look inward and see things within. We are the eyes of that man who lives forever because our consciousness is an eye that sees. This is, uh, I don't know if you guys have been watching the Vikings, but uh, that's the, the seer in that. Uh, Thing. But in, anyway, um, so we're going to talk about today just the uh, the animus uh, in in the uh, as it appears in the unconscious. Now uh, the uh, um, we'll go back to the conscious what how it appears in consciousness later. But I thought we'd first look at it as how it it appears in the unconscious. Okay, and. Uh, um, it is, uh, you, you know, it is this, um, the, you, you know, recognizing the, our animus in our dreams and our active imaginations and holding uh, occasional conversations and debates with it are, you know, these important ways to discriminating between ourselves and the animus. And basically, you know, what the animus needs to do, what, what this is Marion Woodman's definition is that the, uh, that the woman needs to become consciously feminine. And when she is consciously feminine, now the higher animus can fulfill its proper role of being a, the guide to uh, souls. And, uh, it, but it can't happen until, uh, until uh, she's consciously feminine. So uh, all these fairy tales and things. I mean, you remember when uh, in Vasilisa, the beautiful, or all these, the the, or even uh, Sleeping Beauty, 
She has to sleep a hundred years. She has to become consciously feminine before she can find her prince. And and you know in the uh, uh, it, it's in the um, in the uh, cult of Artemis, all the little girls and the young girls have to wear wolf skins or bear skins until they become uh, women before they uh, because if you know von Franz says that if you become a woman too early, that the second half of life tends to be empty. You know, you tend to lose the soul. And, you know, Gary, this, this really is gonna come up here in this idea of where, uh, you, you know, you go to the island that must be visited, you hear a voice that's calling you, you go, go find the voice, and then you're missing for a hundred years. And then you come back and just a few hours have passed. Well, it wasn't you that was gone, it was your soul. It was your soul that went into this other world and so left you out there soulless. And when she comes back, she hasn't changed. You know, so uh, anyway, we're gonna go, uh, the, uh, it, it's the recognition of the animus as an image or fig figure within the psyche is, uh, uh, begins a new difficulty. Who is it? What is it? Um, how many is it? What does it want? And uh, it has, it, it is, is uh, in women, it tends to be, can be manifold. Now it, that's in contrast to the anima, which almost always appears in quite definite forms. Mother, loved one, sister, daughter, mistress, priestess or witch um, it and uh, it has contrasting characteristics it can be light and dark helpful and destructive noble and ignoble but the con on the contrary the animus can often appear as a plurality plur plurality it can be a group of fathers a council a court some other gathering gathering of wise men or else as a lightning quick change artist who can assume any form and makes extensive use of this ability. We're going to find the animus is something that is as wild as the wind and uh, to uh, it's as wild as a horse <laughs> that we uh, at Diane that rears up. It needs to be uh, be tamed uh, or to be in use of, of the uh, to be in use to the feminine. So men experience, now this, this is slightly dated, but you, you can remember that we are the, um, you, you know, uh, what, um, what Aniela Yaffe likes to call us is homo mythicus, not homo sapiens. You know, Jung said, I never met a thinking man. <laughs> We're homo mythicus, we're the maker of symbols. That's what our strange quality is, just strange quality. You know, uh, so, so, you know, that's been going on maybe a half a million years, 400,000, 300, you can pick any date, but, uh, and before that there was very, very conscious uh, hominids. But uh, so man in this period has experienced woman in her role as mother, lover, but uh, uh, et cetera, but always a daughter, uh, grandmother, sister, but always someone related to himself. These are the forms in which his psyche has developed and she's presented herself to the psyche of man, forms in which her fate was carved out until, um, you know, like Emma Young says in the great liberation and well we have to see what happens of of relieving her of the biological task and of the drudgery of of maintaining the hearth plucking chickens you know doing everything else she has to do uh this is going to be a very interesting next four hundred thousand years <laughs> the the uh life of man uh though uh, takes on many more manifold forms in the psyche of a woman because his lack of a biological task 
allowed him time for other activities. And he, he had a more diversified field. And so he can appear in the psyche that was shaped over you know, several hundred thousand years, remember, this is what we're talking about. We're not talking about sociological, cultural sociological decades, either this decade or the next de decade or 100 years ago. Um, you know, like uh, it, it, we're, it, we're, we're doing paleo research here. You know, uh, uh, the animus can uh, appear as a representative uh, or, or a master of any sort of ability or knowledge, but what he lacks is relatedness. You know, uh, he's objective and she's subjective. The anima is uh, characterized um, such that all forms are at the same time forms of relationship. Even if she appears as a priestess or witch, she's in relation to the man, which the anima embodies. But, um, and she either initiates or bewitches him. But the animus does not necessarily express relationship to the woman. You know, Jung also says too, that the animal in us is different in man and woman. He says the animal in man is a brute but the animal in woman possesses great spirit and he, uh, he resembles it to a very wise horse or a very wise uh, any kind of animal that seems to have a relationship with you. And it's not just this ball, uh, charging ball. Uh, and so now because of the fact, so that's a different way of approaching you know, the animal side of us, uh, which, uh, you know, you have to remember we're body, soul, and spirit. This consciousness that we have is very thin and we think it's very wise and profound, but <laughs> it is not very, everything it has, it got from somewhere else, you know? I mean, either from its own dreams and images and, and from its inspirations, which come from the, the feminine really you know or it's it's ability to organize comes only from this is this is a very interesting to me on the idea of the word you know what differentiation in the animus means is to articulate something you know if you don't have words to articulate something you haven't really differentiated it you know uh, so so this idea of the pin set eyes of the masculine that differentiates things, you know, has to do with the uh, with the second creation. In the beginning was the word. You know, the the idea of this differentiation. Now, next time we're going to talk about the. There's four different aspects of in the beginning. There's in the beginning was the. This is for the woman. In the beginning, the animus. In the beginning was the was the power to act. Now, this is what the animus helps the woman do, the power to act. The animus, not the man. In the beginning was the power to act. In the beginning was the deed, the, the heroic thing the woman can do. In the beginning was the word, the ability to be objective and impersonal. She tends to be subjective and personal and near everything's near at hand, where the animus tends to be objective, impersonal, abstract and far away from the earth the and and so he the animus can provide her that and the fourth thing the anima animus can provide is revelation and that is meaning he can provide her revelation now this is not the man this is the animus in in the woman who is consciously feminine who has not identified with her animus who is not you know, the lower animus is ten, tends to be the one of, of opinion or generally accepted uh, 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 knowledge. You know, the animus often gives us generally accepted knowledge, which has no application to the person sitting in front of me right now who feels very, uh, who, who's expre experienced a great wound. I, hey, Craig. Yes. 
Can you hit those four again? The, the four power to act. The power to act in the beginning was uh, the power. Okay, that's in the beginning was the power. The power to act. The uh, uh, Camilla often has dreams about her the instrument to act, her hand getting bit by the unconscious. You know, uh, uh, the power to act, the hands, the instruments. In the beginning was the deed. Now this is sort of the act of of accomplishing something great in her life. Now the negative animus tends to tell us, um, don't start, you're not good enough. Uh, every, other people have done it better. You know, this is the lower animus talking, but not in the beginning was the deed. He, he assists us in, in accomplishing something great. Now these are all, these are like four functions. They all are necessary. And then to make a complete, the in the, in the third one is in the beginning was the word, which is the differentiating uh, aspect of articulating what our eyes behold with no words, okay? With words, we can start to categorize and separate, articulate it. I, I really don't know how else you articulate something without words. You know, I mean, you can experience the no, you know, the Japanese uh, theater, uh, uh, and it is absolutely moving. You don't need words. Uh, music is ungraspable by any words, and so is life. But the idea of the uh, of of the of the word, what the power or the uh, uh, the ability to uh, um, leverage consciousness into a higher state is its ability to categorize and organize through words, the second creation, you know. Now, uh, you know, uh, the one uh, is, uh, it is amazing, the words, you know, the fact that there are, um, I think there's been 20,000 languages that they've identified. There's currently 5,000 being spoken, you know, and, uh, and uh, yeah, you, you know, it, it just happens it, spontaneously everywhere, you know, and it, 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 you know, it was, uh, uh, and, and, and until there was Gutenberg, you know, and writing, it evolved constantly, you know, uh, you know, like uh, it's three generations after uh, you were born, if someone was to come back in the place you are, when before uh, th they had writing and dictionaries and pronunciation guides, you wouldn't be able to understand. Listen to uh, recordings from the 1915 and 1920, uh, the strange uh, way people talk. But, you know, uh, my, my dad used to like to recite the Canterbury Tales, which are in English, by the way, you know, and uh, he, he would go like this. He'd go, um, uh, uh, let's see, he says, even the smallest fowler, making melody that makes you sleepy in all the nista with open ear, you know, <laughs> you know, even the smallest bird uh, makes melodies that you can hear in the during the night as you sleep. But anyway, can you uh, hear? Can you hear me, Craig? Yes, I can. I'm sorry, I I don't mean to contradict you, but I would just like to add something here. Sure. Um. And then I have a question too. Yeah. That they, and when, when I think of, in the beginning there was the word, I don't think of the written word. I no, think of no. the sound. The and sound, I'd like to yes. say that music itself is articulated. Yes. And so, you know, I, you can't make a clear cut distinction here between that. I, Thanks. Yes. Now she is going to talk about music and uh, it's, it's, it's great power and actually how it is one of the most important mediums of expression in, in the feminine consciousness because it, it, it is primarily uh, uses feeling and sensation, you know, and uh, which are uh, 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 
the the if you look at the Myers Briggs, it is is one of the most important. But I I yes, my, music is a wonderful articulation. But I think the articulation I was speaking of was, um, you know, like uh, who who is that guy that wrote the book about uh, about uh, undaunted courage? I can't Stephen somebody or other, but anyway. Uh, he, he mentioned that in the 18th century, everyone always had to put three adjectives. Stephen before. Ambrose. Yeah, Stephen Ambrose. He, yeah, he's he, a, he lived here before he died. Yeah, I mean, it's just a wonderful book. Uh, but he always uh, said that in, in when Jefferson wrote, he always had to put three adjectives in front of every, in every communication. He just made it, you know, you couldn't have a cow. It had to be a... Uh, a, a brown, uh, lazy, uh, old cow. You know, I mean, it always had to have three adjectives. Every noun had to have three adjectives. So, I mean, he was sort of, what I'm saying about articulation is it, it sort of gives us the qualities of what we're seeing and tries to split them out. Because we see it's a brown, lazy, old cow. No one needs to say that out loud, but you know, it is sort of instructive for someone to list the qualities, you know, and maybe not do three, do six, you know, it, it, the idea, that's what I'm talking about, the differentiation. Music is, is divine articulation. And by the way, every word has a, a, a deep, profound thing lying behind it. And there's always a master word, you know, the word that lies behind words. You know, well, and, music, and words are a kind of music. They can be a kind of music in, too. in poetry. Yeah, I yes. mean, uh, I, and, you know, and, and other things, and and theater, and you know, not just poetry. But I, yes, I, Bob Dylan. I mean, you can listen. Yeah. My wife always says, you know, I sit there and listen to that one Desolation Row. You know, uh, it doesn't make any sense. But it was one of the most beautiful songs you ever hear, you know. Uh, they're selling uh -huh. postcards of the hanging. They're painting the passports brown. You know, I mean, it's just this beautiful uh, uh, use of words. Yes. They're, I have to listen musical. to that. But I, the, the, the question, I, <laughs> the question yeah. I have is, you know, you're describing this and I'm sorry, I'm probably getting off topic, but I'm afraid I'll forget these things. I just, um, that th this has to have meaning for men too. You know, you're saying this is the animus and this is what, but for, mm -hmm. it has some kind, it's meaning for man, him, I don't know. I just want to say, what does it mean for man? not just for women, for men. Well, you know, um, we're going to be, uh, I'm not, uh, I will say this, let me just say this, is we're going to be talking more about feminine and masculine energies when we're talking about anima and animus. But I would say that generally speaking, again, by about feminine and masculine energies, I mean, you know, every time if we get too literal about, you know, men in the, in the, 2022 and women in 2022 it 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 really is a uh is a, you, you know james hillman would always say eh, you you suddenly really have entered the world of the lower animus he says he says when, when you start making everything literal you've entered the realm of the of the demonic quality of the lower animus. And, you know, e Edward Ettinger often said that he wouldn't even use such literalisms because he says he would automatically loose, uh, let loose a poison in the room. So the idea is, is that we're, what we're gonna be talking about are energies, not, not to denigrate any uh, pain that either women or men are experiencing today, but, but the idea is that, um, you know, that, let, let me just put it this way. Let's talk symbolically. In, in generally, men are uh, a, are air, meaning, and logos that is in need of substance, earth, 
and nature because they're far away from those things. The feminine energies tend to be close to the, are bound to, uh, at least they were until recently. In fact, at the end of this essay, uh, Emma Young is going to tell us how it's all flipped. Now it is women who are in need of earth, nature, and femininity because, because they have, have, have developed, but into a stage of, of not the meaning of animus, but animus itself, you know, at the lower animus. But then that's what Marion Woodman spent her whole life uh, trying to you know, write books about conscious femininity because she felt she lacked it, you know, and, and she needed to get back to that. And that was her great pain of her whole life, you know. But anyway, I, I just. Uh, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll try to uh, stay just in, in the symbolic realm. I mean, <laughs> we're going to really get into it in a second here. Uh, is, uh, um, uh, you know, there's, there's, anyway, we'll just keep going. The, um, uh, so, so the, uh, we're talking about the animus now. Uh, the um, who's who's t tends to be unrelated, and uh, now he's a spirit. The the other kinds of animus that a woman uh, will encounter is um, uh, sage, judge, artist, astronaut, mechanic, and also of course the stranger, who uh, appears very often. And uh, this is really most characteristic to the purely feminine mind that because spirit stands for what is strange and unknown. Its ability to assume different forms is a quality of spirit. Uh, in addition to its mobility, its power to traverse great distances in a short time, you know, that's what the, uh, um, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, Parsifal tells the Grail King, you know, he says, uh, he says, I scarcely move, but swiftly seem to run. And uh, the Grail King says, you see here, time and space are one. You know, I mean, the, the, uh, it's connected with um, uh, thought and light, which move instantly, uh, the spirit. And uh, now, now she's going to talk about what thought is here, really. It's so interesting. Um, the uh, thought, the word for thought in originally was um, meant a wish, you know, and uh, a lot of fairy tales start, start with the time when wishing was still helpful. Now, the, ain't, the name for Wotan is Aski, which means wish or thought. And the Valkyries were called wish maidens or thought maidens. And Wotan was this spirit god, wind god, and wanderer uh, who led uh, the, uh, was the lord of uh, the army of spirits, the inventors of the rune. And by the way, he leaves an eye in the unconscious uh, in exchange for that. He needed to leave an eye in the unconscious to get the runes out into the outer world, you know, uh, because uh, he needs to keep one eye in the, uh, in the inner world to know what the runes are. He's a typical spirit god, but a primitive form still near to nature. He's the lord of wishes. Uh, when evoked, he can create a wish. And uh, this is from Grimm. Uh, wishing is the measuring, outpouring, giving, creating power that shapes, imagines, and thinks. And therefore, uh, imagine is also imagination that is the expansion of consciousness, idea, and form. It's the wheel of the mind, the oski, the wish. That's the spirit aspect of, of uh, uh, a thought and spirit are closely related and wishes. Animus uh, often appears as aviator, chauffeur, skier, dancer, when lightness, swiftness are emphasized. Transmutability, the ability to assume any form and speed are found everywhere uh, as the attributes of both the male gods and magicians and in our dreams. Now, now um, uh, 
she mentions a uh, uh, I, uh, that it has uh, represents the idea of uh, of the immaterial, living, moving, immaterial quality of spirit. It's living, moving, but it's not material. And without its fixed qualities, uh, no fixed qualities, because it's moving and immaterial, uh, it has a dynamism and expresses the possibility of form or spirit. And she, this is uh, from, I think of the book of John, the wind blows where it wishes, you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. And so it is with everyone born of spirit. So Animus uh, also appears as father, lover, brother, scholar, builder, monk, trader, aviator, chauffeur. It's uh, some, uh, some being who is uh, distinguished by either mental qualities, uh, capacities, or masculine qualities. And uh, um, can also, even though he can be benevolent father, fascinating lover, understanding, or superior friend or superior guide can also be a violent, ruthless tyrant, a cruel taskmaster, a moralistic censor, which is, it seems its primary role is a uh, uh, lower animus, seducer and exploiter. Uh, it's, it's uh, this is a great mystery. I just, just think this is such a, uh, it, you, you know, trying to clarify what's happening in us is, is just such a wonderful uh, adventure. This, uh, it, it all often fascinates with intellectual, intellectual brilliance and moral irresponsibility. It can sometimes be a boy, a, a, a son, or a young friend, especially when the woman's uh, component, a masculine component is in a state of become, becoming, it, it, it uh, appears in a plural form when it's giving us generally accepted truths. It tends to per, um, uh, appear in, in singular form for other purposes. Uh, it, it is in dreams and visions where the animus presents itself to the inner eye and how it appears in the dream world sort of identifies its archetypal character, the masculine consciousness. In, uh, in us. You have to remember that the outer men you see don't conform to your consciousness. Neither do the women I see out here conform to my feminine uh, uh, idea of the feminine. You know, so uh, we're talking about what's inside of us, not what's outside of us. I mean, how, we, how we could change the outside men or women that we see is, uh, is not what we're talking about here. The, it, now, here's, here's a dream. We're going to just go through four animus dreams real quick here. Um, well, we're running out of time. But there, uh, 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 there appeared a bird-headed monster whose body was just a distended sack or bladder. It was able to take on any and every form. The monster was said to have uh, formerly... Now, this was... I, I forgot to mention. This woman had just um, was breaking up with her lover and her animus image began to detach itself from this person on whom it had been projected. So there appeared in after, after this happened, a bird headed monster whose body was just a distended sack or bladder, but it was, it was, could take on any form. It could become any animal at once. And the, the monster was said to have been in possession of the man she had broken up with. And the woman was warned to protect herself against it because it liked to devour people. And if, if, it, if this happened, the person was not killed outright, but just continued living in the monster. So you're basically possessed by the animus. You know, this is the idea of, of you're living inside a monster. Hey, you know, the, the, the consciousness that everyone sees around you is not you. It is, it is the, it is the uh, identifying with the animus and, and you are a prisoner inside it. You're not killed outright. And uh, um, you know, she says the bladder form indicates something in initial stage. Only the head, the uh, characteristic organ for the animus is differentiated. And uh, it's also the head of a creature of the air 
the rest of the body uh, could take any shape. Now it's voraciousness indicated a need for extension and development. It's just very, uh, uh, you, you know, it's starved. It needs extension and development. It hasn't had any attention from us yet. <laughs> you know, as we give it attention, it, 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 as an any alchemical L emblem, it, if you give any uh, unconscious uh, uh, thing attention, it will become more human. The reason it isn't human right now is because you haven't been giving it any attention. So it, and it's also its voraciousness that thus as this non-human uh, aspect is, uh, it, it, it says it needs to be ex extended and developed in consciousness and it's still very undifferentiated. She gives this wonderful uh, 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 description really of the animus uh in this state from the upanishads you know uh and it's the wind is in truth the all devourer for when the fire dies out it goes into the wind when the moon sets it goes into the wind when the waters dry up they go into the wind this is the animus uh for or it's the spirit for the wind consumes them all thus it is with respect to the divinity but as respect to us the breath is in truth the all devourer. For when a man sleeps, speech goes into the breath, the eye goes into the breath, the ear uh, too, and the manas, that's sort of the, the magic soul, for the breath consumes them all. And so they're both the two devourers, wind among the gods and breath among living men. Um, there's, there's a lot in here. I'm gonna just try to finish up with just a few things here. Uh, I think it's going to take us about two or three times to do this uh, uh, thing in in uh, so we can understand it. But the whole idea is to read uh, Emma Young on the animus and then go into one of her fairy tales and have some kind of idea of the of the uh, uh, you, you know what are they what do they call the uh, biology of the species <laughs> that we're going to be studying now. Uh, the uh, idea, uh, now she also, in this same dream, uh, there uh, appeared an, to the woman a sort of a fire spirit. It was an elementary being consisting only of flame and in perpetual motion, never stopped moving. And it called, the flame itself called itself the son of the lower mother. Now this mother, the son of the lower mother is in contra contrast to a heavenly light mother and it embodies the primordial uh, feminine as uh, a power that is heavy, dark, earthbound, uh, and it's a power versed in magic, now helpful, now witch-like and uncanny, and uh, often uh, destructive. Now, uh, her so her son in this dream is the, the son of the Lord Mother, is a chthonic fire spirit. Now, uh, Here's just some chthonic fire spirits. One was Loki. Uh, he's, he's a fire spirit. Uh, uh, sly, seductive rascal. Uh, re really is the, who the devil is. The devil is Loki. You know, it really is. Uh, yeah, and Loki and Pan. Uh, in, and in, now there was another fire spirit. And now see, Loki was an uncontrolled fire and a very primitive uh, animus figure, but there's also one. Hephaestus was the god of the fire, of the earth, but his fire was the was a fire of uh, of forge. He was the god of forging, so his fire is a controlled fire, where uh, where Loki's was a out of control fire. So um, they are both sons of the lower mother. Uh, uh, other than um, in contrast to um, to uh, uh, the spirit gods of of of, um, of Wotan and Hermes, who are not sons of the lower mother, they are the sons really of uh, a far away heavenly father. Now, <laughs> actually, I think they're the you know the idea of of Phanes and uh, uh, 
uh, Abraxas, you know, they, they represent the what of God, not the who of God. So uh, I think the, uh, uh, they, they both Hermes and Wotan belong to the what of a faraway heavenly uh, energy. Uh, and uh, she, she has some more dreams, but let's just finish a little bit. Uh, we'll pick those up next time. Let's finish with the uh, idea of, of the music. Um, you know, there's this magician who uh, has this girl in his power and she's dancing before the king and she's hypnotized by manic, magic and she's supposed to dance a dance of transformation in which she throws off one veil after another and impersonates a, a motley succession of figures, both animals and men, at the instruction of the animus or the magician. So, you know, it's sort of like the, uh, 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 you know, the anima, uh, the anima of transformation and the anima of addiction. You know, you, you can uh, transform into spirit either through the anima of transformation or you can uh, get high on coke or heroin or something or alcohol and you'll be transformed all right. But it's not the transformation that we're talking about here. So she's uh, uh, is, is transforming, but at the instruction of the animus. But suddenly uh, this king uh, it exerts his influence on her and she goes more and more into ecstasy and disregarding the orders of the magician. She dances on and on and until finally, as though throwing her body off as the, her last veil, she falls to the earth, a skeleton. Her remains are buried, but out of the grave, a flower grows and out of the flower, a white woman. So uh, here we have this deal of the, uh, uh, or a, a motif of where the uh, animus transfers from the lower animus to the higher animus. The, the king sets limits to the magician's power over her and he brings it about that she no longer dances at his command, but of her own volition. So this transformation previously only, only indicated now becomes a reality because the dancer uh, dies and then comes up from the earth, transformed now in truth, in a changed and purified form as the white uh, woman. So uh, uh, on the, uh, the magician, the lower form of the animus uh, makes the girl uh, take on or imitate uh, various roles, but that's not transforming while the king embodying a higher principle brings about her real transformation, not just a fake one. And uh, uh, it brings up this uh, idea of the uh, music. We'll go into later into the main eds and uh, uh, some, some really, I, I don't know if you guys have ever read Esther Harding's uh, Women's Mysteries, but uh, you know, Moon Mysteries. But I just wanna mention really quickly about the music uh, idea of uh, uh, where the um, you know the Pied Piper of Hamlin, Orpheus, uh, this this idea of uh, uh, ab abduction by spirit to cosmic musical regions, you know um, the it uh, uh, we. Uh, to characterize more closely the form of spirit which is is acting in this these phenomena of where um, we vanish into nature or the underworld. Now this is it, we're vanishing into music, really. Uh, it, the the psychic energy withdraws from consciousness and the and from all application to the outer world, and it disappears into some other world. We know not where. The world we go into is more or less a conscious fairyland. This is music. This is what we're going into, uh, to, into that 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 realm of the no, the no. Here, everything is as is is fitted out in a way to compensate for the literalness of the outer world. 
And uh, often these worlds are so distant and lie at such depths that no recollection of them ever penetrates our waking consciousness. We sense them, but we, you know you can't really articulate them as, as uh, uh, Diane was saying. And uh, uh, we've been drawn away somewhere, but we don't know, know where. And even when we return to ourselves, we cannot say what took place in this interval. So this is sort of like the, the person who, you know, goes into the uh, uh, place and he's gone for a hundred years and doesn't know it. You know, I mean, it's just this a wonderful stepping out of reality. And uh, it can be compared to music, attraction and abduction uh, by the rat catcher or, uh, uh, or Orpheus is understood as an uh, objectification of the spirit. It does not express now. Now this is talking also about the higher animus uh, without words here or not without, uh, without um, it's a different aspect of the knowledge of the animus or the, what the animus can impart to us. It doesn't, and it's actually is one of the highest expressions, mediums and expressions of feminine energy does not express knowledge in the usual logical intellectual sense, nor does it shape matter. Instead, it gives sensuous representation to our deepest associations and our most unchangeable laws. Music is spirit. Spirit that leads into obscure distances beyond the reach of consciousness. And it is a content that not cannot be grasped, you know. No, you know what they uh, it, the content of of the Upanishads, you know. No tongue can soil it, you know. Uh, it's um, it's strange to say though. It can be uh, somewhat uh, more, more easily understood with numbers, <laughs> you know, with the musical scale. Uh, but simultaneously and before all else, it's uh, understood by feel. It's understood and comprehended by feeling and sensation. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, that you comprehend by feeling and sensation. That is just a wonderful idea. Uh, it, this paradoxical relationships like these. Show, now, this is the higher animus too. Remember. Paradoxical relationships like these show that music admits us to the depths where spirit and nature are still one. That's where music takes us, where spirit, it takes us to a place of unity, where spirit and nature are still one or have become one. So music constitutes one of the most important and primordial forms in which women ever experience spirit. Uh, this, this is Emma Young talking. <laughs> this explains why music and dance are such important medium of expressions for women. The ritual dance is always based on spirit and abduction by spirit to cosmic musical regions it, remote from the world of consciousness forms a counterpoint to the one of mentality, of the thinking aspect of the animus, which is very, you don't hear of this very often stated like this, which is uh, usually uh, uh, um, only directed towards, uh, uh, you know, impersonal abstractness, not feeling and sensation. The, you know, the feminine, uh, you know, young, I mean, uh, Von Franz says that, uh, you know, that woman experiences enlightenment through love and its powers, you know, and where men experience enlightenment somewhere far away from that, you know, and uh, that's what, what, you know, it is, is uh, it. So uh, this idea of experiencing animus or the, the, the spirit at, at almost the highest level, you can experience it through feeling and sensation through music is, is so beautiful.
you know, and, and, and I, you know, everything we do is temporary. You know, the gates of heaven never open to us. I mean, all of these revelations are very transitory, you know, uh, that, that was at the end of, uh, of, of Faust. That's what, what Goethe says, you know, that, that everything that's transitory is but a reference, you know, and, uh, uh, and then Nietzsche responds, everything that's eternal is but a reference. So I mean, it's just this idea, who are we? You know, we're, we're going around experiencing all these, these little epiphanies and they seem to deepen and deepen. And uh, uh, I, I think the, the, the real thing that can happen though is movement. If we can move and attain weight somewhere, you know, and at a still point that doesn't move and we have a great a foundation there. That I think is the real task here. You know, I don't think uh, it is, uh, uh, and, and you, you know, I think the only way, I, you tell me, how do you do that other than through your own dream images? I don't think you can do it through reading or I don't know, maybe you can just open it up, but I, it's the discussion, but I really think that the only way that you develop that place within you, uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I often think about the, the soulless world. What would be world without soul? And wh where is soul? Is soul there? Is no soul there? No, soul is here, you know, <laughs> within you. It is the water of life within us. And, it, 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 you know, when Young is watering things and you're seeing water in your dreams and, and you know, uh, and, Aqu and Aquarius is carrying a wand around a water vessel, what he's carrying around is soul, you know, and what, and, and that, that is, is, I think, I, it's only my, uh, and I know Hillman really expresses this so beautiful in uh, Anima, the uh, anatomy of a personified notion, you know, the, the idea of the, of living with soul. And I think that's, that's what we're going to try to do in the fairy tale. You know, if you read a fairy tale or amplify a dream, you are always soul is with you. I mean, I feel it. I just call it like the blessed hour when when that happens because uh you, you, you know this is going to come up here is that on, to, only until we start doing something for its own sake especially the woman she needs to do something for its own sake and not to help that person or to clean up that mess or to you know make my house more beautiful but only until she does something for its own sake can she, uh, ex, uh, can the animus really help her? You know, I mean, it, what, what the, the work of the soul, the anima in man and the work of, this, of the animus is always, remember uh, Jung says that uh, the, the way to moisten this dry earth is that you need to do something not for ego's sake, but for the sake of the center or for God. And we'll never stoop that low. No, if it doesn't help ego and it's only for God's sake, we're not interested. But what this, this idea of everything with Jungian psychology and with studying dreams and all of this, it's not for ego's sake, for the outer world. It is for God's sake that we're doing this and who God is. I'm not saying I, I know I'm saying that let's just say the divine realms, the, the, the informing wisdom of nature, whatever you want to call, it, you know, well, anyway, um, uh, we'll finish it up next time. This was a little bit unorganized, but I'll get a little more organized. I kind of started on the fly, but I just thought we'd go through animus and anima. There's so it's so beautiful. I haven't, been able to express its beauty yet but um and then we'll go into maybe we'll start with rapunzel because everybody's having dreams about uh towers we'll find out <laughs> what does a tower mean you know well gary uh ooh, we don't have much time i'm sorry but why don't you uh 
well, everybody get a chance to speak. Just say anything you want. I mean, I don't care. Yeah, I'm going to, I think I'll start from the bottom and work my way up. So Zen, you're uh, first. Take you there. We can come. Hi, um, so I was thinking about um, uh, the meaning of animus. You said you talked about the meaning of animus and animus itself. And you use the word literal. So I don't, uh, I'm not sure if I quite understand it because to me, the way I see it, I see uh, men and women as uh, they, we call it um, male form and female form. And then uh, to me, animal and animals um, are principles. They call it principles. So principle is basically the energy. And um, probably what you mean by the meaning of animal and animals? I don't know. And we also have gender. So gender is a kind of, gender is different with um, animal and animals principles. So I think we have to, um, like for example, these days they talk about gender neutrality and um, uh, what each gender um, brings to us. Like there's this idea that um, there's no gender and uh, we've been taught, like we've been raised with certain um, um, ideas. So uh, there's no difference between women and men. And uh, it's just the way we, we've been raised that it told us that women are like this and men are like this, which are very much against it because principles, as principles, animal and animals are really, really opposite to each other. They're very different. And um, even in their manifestation as male form and uh, female form, as Jung says, we don't have much in common. We would not be able even to talk to each other if it wasn't for animal and animals. So I have a kind of male principle, male energy in my psyche, and that makes me able and that, uh, to talk to a man. Otherwise, um, as a female, my world is completely different. So I think you know, we have to think, talk about this and a little bit differentiate between principle, gender, and I'm not sure what you were um, talking about when you said the difference between animus meaning and animus. I didn't get it. Okay, I'm, uh, well, let me just, uh, oh wait, am I muted? Oh no, I'm um, the, first of all, the, we're, we're primarily going to be focused on the manifestations of animus and anima in dreams and fairy tales and myths. So that's that's that that's that's the raw material of it. But I would say, as far as as gender spectrum, let's just put it this way: is this is unless you are fully conscious of the entire universe. There's a part of you that you're unconscious of in, in the, the relationship between eros and logos. Now, you might be more conscious, like uh, if uh, Marion Woodman said that she had went too far to logos, a woman, and she really needed to rediscover eros in her. So I think really what we're, what, what, that it's like if I'm a if I am an intuitive, it's my tool that I use in the outer world. If I am a very feminine woman, uh, who's who's you know very uh, uh, feminine, I use that as my tool of operating in the outer world. So my unconscious compensates for that by all the things that I'm not aware of in in, in the outer world. So I don't care, I, I, whatever realm of the spectrum you are on on gender, you have focused on 
a, a narrow enough band so that you can navigate, okay, wherever you are uh, on the bell curve, okay? So that's what you're conscious of. There is a huge spectrum which you're not conscious of. And I think that's what will come up in dreams. Now, whether it's expressed as animus or anima, as they classically come up in dreams, no, probably not. But they're going to be some strange mixture. You, you know, you often see in dreams now of a woman with three helpful friends. You know, where's the shadow here? There's no shadow, you know. And, uh, or, or, you know, I mean, it's, it's just interesting. But, but I think the idea of the literalness, now, I wasn't sure what you meant by the animus as meaning. Uh, there's four kinds of animus identified by Emma Young. Uh, and she is, is saying there's four different qualities of the animus. And, and one is the ability to act, you know, the active principle. That's what Hermes always tells me, because I don't, I'm very passive. He says that you need to act and I will be your tool of action in the outer world if you identify with me, then the second one is the deed that is to be uh, accomplished something great or in your own sphere. Uh, and then the, the third one is, is the ability to be objective and impersonal, even though your tendency is to be subjective, personal, immediate, near at hand and sorting your seeds one by one. In other words, you're living in an I thou realm. If you're, if you are the most wonderful feminine uh, being, in, uh, the most consciously feminine uh, woman in, in the world, you can't help but be I thou. Every being you meet, you uh, have be sta standing behind you, the principle of eros, love, and the great mother as you approach them, if you're really consciously feminine. Where, what does the man have? when he approaches somebody, you know, as a consciously masculine uh, person, you know, it, it's a, it's a, he's, he's looking at him and says, well, I could probably beat you up. You're maybe worth 300 bucks a week and uh, I wouldn't hire you. You know, <laughs> Some, I don't know. Uh, I'm just saying that, but, but I would say the literal aspect is if, if you ever, uh, everything we're going to be talking about here are, you know, Jung called his himself an empiricist. So everything we're talking about is what we experience in, uh, in dreams and uh, uh, visions. That's our, that's our raw data. Anything out here is, is right now too literal. If we can fully comprehend that, that realm, maybe we can then apply it out here. But it tried it, this is the, this is a huge task to comprehend that in inner world. I don't understand the meaning of too literal. Too literal? Well, like if you have a dream that you murdered somebody, does that mean that you really murdered somebody? <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. No, it doesn't mean that. Or in a dream that you died, did you really die? You know, you didn't really die. There was something in you that needed to be die or there's something in you that needed to be uh, 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 uh you know it needs to be gone there's nothing literal about it you know that's what uh that um von francis schizophrenics tend to do is they have a voice in them telling them to kill their parents and they go and kill them you know where I really I understand the meaning of literal, but I didn't understand when you say taking anima and animus to literal, not in dreams, but uh, I was wondering what it means to take animus to literal or animus. Okay, well, uh, you know what I'm saying is that you make it uh, non-symbolic. Mm -hmm. Is that what, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. Not That's all I can, I don't know how else to. Okay. What do you think? Is that what? How would you describe it? I mean, it's just something that's not uh, dry and uh, factual. It has nothing to do with the factual world. Fixed, yeah, like something fixed. Right. 
I can respond to that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the more I think about this, the more I, I consider gender to be the identification of the ego in the, in the outer world and anima and animus being the balancing factors in the inner world that is constellated in the unconscious and, and produces a great deal of force that impacts the way we lead our conscious lives in the outer world. And so um, I think what you're trying to get at is, is to try to take the unconscious energy and literalize it is not the same thing as trying to digest it. So when you talk about the dreams or the schizophrenic vision of killing your parents, there's a, there's a symbolic meaning to that that would achieve balance in the personality. Yes, But if you take it literally and you go out and kill somebody, it doesn't do anything to that, to that imbalance. And so the, right. the problem is still there. You know, I killed my parents like the, the, the energy told me to do. And now I'm still having the same issues. Um, and so it, the more I think about like incorporating my mm -hmm. anima, it has to do with how I live out my masculine life in the outer world. And the more I can incorporate feminine principles of, of um, emotion and relationship and um, the, the softer way of dealing with the world, the more I can do that in my masculine life, then the more my anima also becomes balanced and, and becomes more forceful. And um, the qualities that you mentioned, the ability to be objective and impersonal. So it seems like, um, and this is where I think the, the diversity of, of gender is really helpful. So people can say, you know, I'm not, I'm not black or white. I'm somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. It's easier for us, I think, to be able to say, okay, if I'm a, a really effeminate gay man, then my anima is probably going to be really, you know, masculine and strong and powerful and impersonal and all those things you talked about. Yeah, yeah, whatever you're not conscious of. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the, uh, uh, the unconscious is going to uh, use as its way really of transformation. You know, I really don't think, it, you, you know, I think the, 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 the unconscious is not that concerned with you rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, you know, uh, of, 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 of exactly that your conscious life and you know, Von uh, Emma Young says this in this book. It's not so concerned with your personal woes; it's concerned that that you're neglecting it. You know, I I really think that's true. I mean, do you know of any dreams that really don't say you are neglecting me? You know, I mean, it just seems that they're all kind of saying that I need your attention you are uh, out here in the outer world and you are completely ignoring me. So I think that's what it's doing. And by the way, me or the inner world is our source. And it is this wisdom that took sand and rocks and water and created eyes, Mozart, Picasso, and, uh, 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 everything else beautiful in the world, uh, the the birds of paradise, the uh, uh, you know all these uh, uh, dolphins, leaping dolphins, and everything else. That's who makes send you your dreams every night. That same wisdom, and don't you think if like you know I always say if you could prove there was life on other planets, oh wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, what if they could prove that 
the dream maker in you is a living being and it is the same being that created you then would you pay more attention to what it says and plus when it can you send you these absolutely I, I where do you find anything more profound than a dream i don't know angelique i saw a smile on your face earlier so mm -hmm. we'll go to you next Uh oh, we're not getting uh, any sound. Not going to work. Okay, uh, Camilla, would you like to make a comment? Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, I've, I've been reading the book over the last few days, and um, I think it's a really amazing uh, exposition, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, I was struck by how deep the animus chapter is, and in opposition to the anima, which is more like a reference guide to fairy tales and mm -hmm. dreams. Mm -hmm. It's like it's visible or pertinent, no, not pertinent, apparent that she hasn't, that she is a woman, obviously, that the, she hasn't perhaps gone through this, although it's a great reference guide, no doubt about that, but I just felt that something was more surface than the animus uh, chapter of them. And then I thought about um, the discussion that was raised by Asim. And uh, my comparison is always with falling in love. Do you think that the one you are falling in love with is the other? Or is it really that unknown aspect of yourself that you have in contact with yet? And um, yeah. Thank you. It's beautiful, Camilla. It's beautiful. Dahlia, would you like to go next? Uh, I'll, I don't know. I'm, I have many ideas, and uh, I think it's, um, I'd say it's uh, very on time for me as well, this, the discussion, because I have many, maybe, questions about the projection. You, when you have a projection, and then you have it you have on someone and then you have it in the dreams as well and it gets mixed up mm. <laughs> so i don't know i know it just i think that's what i wanted to share but i think i'll i'll we'll we'll have more occasion to talk in dream sessions and yeah. later so yeah. i think that's it but dahlia, love the discussion. Yeah. yeah dahlia has the most wonderful dreams i would say like dahlia and and cat they are their dream egos are just unbelievably resilient i mean they're just almost seem like they are uh, uh I, I don't know they're just very heroic in in both of them do you have anything for us today ava oh i'm um... Uh, compa comparing to uh, to my dreams and i feel it's uh, it's very good to have this concept of of uh, and uh, um, and search for uh, and and not being so uh, into who is that person uh, uh, comparing to, to the Ullman method, when we didn't have this kind of concepts, mm -hmm. it's uh, much better and uh, uh, it helps me to understand my dreams and um, in, in a deeper way and look at all uh, this kind of men that <laughs> shows up, mm -hmm. Jordan Peterson and even Tim Holmes, <laughs> and 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 to look at at it as in different aspects of uh, also in some way connecting to my per own personality and not only to uh, everyday life and and uh, uh, yeah oh I can't explain more. <laughs> 
but um, it, it, I'm very glad at, that I have uh, got more uh, knowledge about this kind of device man and, and uh, anima and animals and it, it became it have became clearer for me, yeah. but it's very hard to it's and confusing sometimes. Yeah, it, it is really. I mean, I mean, I no, no matter how much you know, you know, one thing that that the uh, uh, young said one time is that the uh, everyone asked him why the anima was so clear, but the animus was so uh, so obscure, and. He said that the animus is a very clever fox. It covers mm. its tracks with its tail. You know, uh, it, it's this Loki aspect that it's 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 very it's very tricky. You know, so uh, yeah, it's not it is not clear. But I mean, I think we just get a few examples of it in the outer world, and and we just keep adding. What she says, this is what Emma Young says. After you've seen a few of these, and then you see someone else, she says, it's like if you're walking down the street and you see uh, the same set of uh, strangers every day. Some, you start to get familiar with this same set of strangers and you start to uh, uh, recognize some of their traits, but they're always kind of strangers, you know. Quandrum, would you uh, like to make a comment? I guess replying to you and others, what I find more fascinating about this whole process is that once you start doing like identifying the energies, I guess you start to see them in the outer line. Like, uh, I don't know, when I got into this whole process, I thought it will be just some like inner work or something like that. But, that was I keep on keep on going. I do realize that it's my outer life is transforming just as so much. Andrew, you're you're breaking up quite a bit, you know. And sometimes what works when that's happening is if you kill your video, then you'll get more bandwidth on the audio. Try that. Okay, sorry. Is is, is it now bad? It's still breaking up, but not quite as bad. I don't really have anything important to say, but just to cut it short, I guess um, what I find more exciting is that once you get in touch with your animal or animals, I guess. Oh, so you, true. You, yeah, yeah. You, the outer life transforms. Like, you start seeing, like, like for, for, for me, for example, I. Once I got in touch with my anima, and I'm still pretty young at that, but I'm, I'm seeing a glimpse of her in other females in the like, outer world, which has been pretty exciting. Really not. <laughs> yeah, so. Thank you. Um, I think yeah, Angelique is back too, if you want to. I think she's. I wonder if oh, she. Can... Angelique, you want to give it another try? <laughs> see if you have audio i i, I don't know yeah. if you can hear me i'm really yeah. sorry oh I it works terrible... it works no we can hear you yes thank you <laughs> i have terrible connection issues so i have lost all the last 10 minutes and even parts of of today's session i i really um liked um very much the bits that had to do with animals and music mm -hmm. um Music has been a lot in my dreams uh, about a couple of years ago, and my animals being a musician, they were very persistent dreams, and I also decided to take them literally, so I ended up with a grade three on the cello, uh, mm. something I had uh, never, ever dreamt of. Oh, <laughs> of wow. Um, it was rather a magical connection, I couldn't explain, because my sensation was my last uh, is my bottom function. Yeah. So it was really a struggle and it was only purely because the dreams mm, were persistent that I decided uh, I will take on cello. So I was, I, was, I was feeling ridiculous to be honest, but then 
I felt it was something that the dreams were prescribing. And um, so, yes, um, some very nice enlightening information yeah. of about and, and um, thank you very much. Yeah, didn't Socrates Damon tell told him to start playing a, a flute or something? Yeah. Well, anyway, you were very clear up until that last point. It was absolutely right. beautiful. Uh, Kevin. Yeah, um, uh, I have to really stop myself here because anima and animus is, uh, I have such a fascination for these two, two archetypes. And um, well, I just wrote some two or three points. Um, one is that uh, the uh, personification of the psychic reality. So they, they exist outside the human realm. So we are, we are just an expression, a consequence of that. And another thing I wrote was that, um, yeah, I also think this is, uh, um, that I think that all archetypes are derivative from these two archetypal um, anima and animus, because anima and animus is really one, uh, which is the self. And I also believe um, the ego um, the anima and animus is, is the pillar for the ego consciousness. So every time we comment something on the ego, we, in the background, we are also commenting on the anima and animus. And perhaps the last is that um, they are the building blocks of reality itself, basically. Um, yeah, so it's, which goes back to the so self. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. that comment, every time you say something, you, you're also saying something about your animal or animus. Is, would that be almost from the shadow then, you think? Or? They are lower, they are, they are, they are like, um, how do you say this? They're foundation blocks. So like I said, um, all archetypes are derivative from anima and animus. All, all other archetypes has to be because um, Anima and animus is the plus and the minus sign to, to create an energy flow. And, the, and that way it makes this different combination. And that's where the archetypes bo bo um, gets born, sort of. And yeah, it so, sounds like a make a good presentation sometime. <laughs> Another. Uh, Susan? Um, yeah, wonderful to be here in person. I've listened to so many of your YouTube groups and um, I, I just have to kind of take a lot of notes and then reread my notes over and over again. <laughs> um, I guess just some of the thoughts I had just briefly were just that the, you know, that the woman ego really has to hold her own with the negative animus because Logos is so overvalued and yes. Um, and that if, you know, it seems like the shadow work is so important for the woman to bring weight and to bring fullness and to, and then, and I love that idea of that, um, the differentiation part of the animus really has, it's kind of, to me, it almost seems like it starts with the separation of the shadow from, and the animus, like that weird marriage that, yes kind of works against the feminine ego. And um, so the shadow work seems to, to, to need to be either uh, along the same process um, or the kind of beginning stages or um, so. Um, and that the differentiated kind of love is very different than no love that isn't differentiated and is clingy and needy and, um, so it does seem like Eros is the ultimate kind of goal, but it's um, that we need both, you know, to, to be able to express that. So, um, and thank you for just wonderful, wonderful seminar. Yeah, thank you, Susan. I hope it's a little more organized next time. I didn't really get to comprehend it myself very well yet. Oh, could you send out the page numbers and stuff we'll be covering next time, Craig? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, this time we sort of covered 20 through 42, and next time we'll cover 1 through 42. But, uh, I mean, pro probably what we missed this time was 1 through 20. It was so personal. 
I thought we should start out with the impersonal first, but I didn't get through that very well. But but we'll just do two or three sessions on the animus, and then we'll jump into the fairy tales. It is pretty theoretical, but uh, you, you know, I just thought it might. Uh, it, it is a very deep chapter, and I agree with Camilla that um, Emma seems to feel the animus. I don't think she feels the anima that well. John, do you have, have a comment? Thanks, Gary. Um, and thanks, Craig. That was amazing. I'm just a little confused because I didn't get a chance to do any of the reading this week. Yeah, It's been a hectic week traveling and working and stuff. But I guess I have a question more than a comment at this point. Um, I, I just, I love these sessions so much. I, I always learn so much. And uh, there's a lot of supportive reading I have to do on the side just to keep up. But um, I probably should ask this question in the beginning since I'm new to the group. But is this that you do on Sunday supportive to what you guys do on Saturday? Or is it amplification on Saturday? Because I'm just wondering why we stopped uh, with uh, the living symbol and then moved over to this. Um, and that's why I was saying that if it's, if it's a place you guys are going in your dream group, that's one thing. I'm just, I was just wondering, you know, how, what's the format, I guess, is the best question. You're uh, muted, Craig. Um, I, I just thought that people enjoyed the fairy tales more. And we'd gotten to the end of the first part of the living symbol, and there's three more parts. And it was pretty slow going. So I thought I'd try to finish it myself. And we just do uh, sort of these more self-contained uh, fairy tales, which I think people just enjoyed more. That's all. I just thought that it was, uh, it was uh, other than uh, the living symbol is, is uh, you know, there's never any resolution. You know, there's some progress, but, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, just a living person who keeps having problems. So then fairy tales much. is a little more, yeah, it's a little more inspirational, I guess. Wayne? Oh, you're a muted. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. It's really good to be here and hear you all. And um, my own experience just seems to build right alongside everyone in this group. I really feel a part of an intuitive process that feeds what is growing in me, what wants to grow more in me. And um, I just appreciate it and am grateful, especially... You know, the tarot is builds on uh, the Wong Janus with her, may I, may I uh, see clearly, you know, that, that's, that's kind of my, that's what I need more logos in my life, clearly. <laughs> oh, we need all, we all need that. <laughs> <laughs> so you get Fab you. Fabio. Uh, yeah, and, Fabio, would you like to go Diane, I, I don't know. Yep. Yeah. yeah, oh, hi, everybody. Um, it is really uh, one of the most difficult uh, topics in Jungian psychology. Mm. If you get like the collective works, even Freud and words, he mentions a little bit about it. It's so hard, difficult. That's why maybe it's confusing. We have like 7 billion people on earth, 7 billion opinions on uh, animals. It's really hard. But I think one of the things um, in a practical sense we can use to help us a little bit more is the function of projection. We, uh, some, somebody mentioned that through projections onto the outside world, we may have an idea of what's going on with animus and uh, anima within us. And also Emma Young, I think, uh, in her book, she mentions that we have all of us, we have both, uh, but one is in the unconscious and the other one is in the physiological yes. body. We can't forget yeah, that beautiful. because when we get sickness, disease, that's maybe something related to a sick animus or a sick uh, animal as well. Yes. So that through analysis, we try to understand a little bit more what's going on with our uh, female side as a man or male side as a woman. Uh, and also like falling in love or having a boss or a you know, father or somebody around us. It's 
if it's a woman, uh, giving some hints of how it's going on within. That's why Emma's young, uh, Emma Young's book, uh, she mentions a chauffeur or uh, any kind of you know person in, in the daily life, because it's through projection that maybe we have an idea of a such difficult topic. And for sure in dreams, it's amazing. So that's why I believe in my own opinion uh, that we always need to keep attention and uh, really yeah, pay attention to the outside world, what's going on around us, because that's something communicating with something else within. So if we identify that, we identify within and maybe we see what's going on but it's really very very complicated <laughs> very hard yeah. yeah if we're possessed by the animus or possessed by the anima we don't know it you know it, it, we we think this is all us talking but it's not us there's another voice talking you know and uh, I, I i hear that when people are feeling uh, we're a victim of life rather than its conductor uh, of a symphony, that means they're possessed by the, either the animus in themselves or the animus in their, uh, the great mother, you know? I mean, it, the, the idea of, of feeling um, that you're not uh, the conductor of your own life. That's from Hillman, by the way, not me. D did Diane get to speak? No, or we're did up. Diane, speak? you're up, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you, Fabio. That's beautiful. Well, I don't think Tim did either. Tim, look, you look like you have something you really Yeah, go ahead, about. Tim. Yeah, go ahead, Tim, too. Well, I I feel like I I said the the most important piece. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. This is constantly a fascination for me because I think a great deal of the population cannot conceive of what a symbolic life is and can only operate on the literal. And, and all of us, I think, um, suffer from, from being sub subsumed in the literal. And I think part of this whole work that we're engaged in is trying to become more conscious of the symbolic life and what that means and how we can unfold a, a more deeply meaningful life by just simply being open to the symbol. And I, I'm thinking more and more of, of the literal life as being the physical everyday stuff and, and the symbolic being the spiritual and the, um, the transcendent and all these, all these things that we talk about in, in various languages. But, uh, but gosh, if, if more people were, were able to just conceive that there's more to life than just the, the literal, we'd be so much better off. <laughs> well, it, you know, I just think of, uh, of Ava's dreams uh, and, and, and what richness they brought to her. That, that richness has come into my life in my own dream life, uh, you, you know, just to, uh, to meet the man in the bearskins or the, the magician or, you know, in my case, uh, you, you know, I'm just saying if it, I need that now. If I don't have it, I feel uh, uh, when you when you lose that after you've met it, you will experience a grief like you've never experienced before. Go ahead, Diane. Uh, yeah, well, I just wanted to say that um, I agree with a lot of what everyone has said, and it's very helpful. It's like Elaine. Yeah, I feel like this. As we progress, this becomes is meeting something in me that is wanting to to be birthed. And um, I, Kevin, thank you so much for that. Um, I mean, not a reminder. It's more of a really trying to get it through my head that that inner being, that inner archetype that's in the place of the animus give energizes whatever we need to do need energizes what needs to come out in us and um 
And I think that it's like what, like Camila said that, uh, you know, I think I, it took me a long time to learn that, you know, uh, the person that I'm dealing with on the outside is not the animus that's on the inside. And I also have learned, it seems like, that that archetype, in the, and, and I don't know if this is true, I, it seems like it's somewhat true for the anima too, because it can change over life at the different stages in your life. So it looks like I'm the archetype that I'm is trying to speak to me from my dreams as the animus has changed. And uh, that's really uh, going to be helpful to me to look at that. And um, also, I spoke too soon, Craig, earlier on, but that part about the music is just beautiful and how um, it looks like in the stream that you told <clears throat> that there was a, a master, like a, a negative animus, <clears throat> who was the master of the uh, dream, who was causing the woman to dance and uh, have these uh, appearances come forth from her dance that were not herself. But then when her, the outside and the dream itself, if you see that um, the outside animus in the dream, the king that she was dancing for, when he came to her aid, I mean, this is kind of complicated what I'm trying to say, but she was able to uh, manifest her true self. Yes. And so that's what it's all about for us. But we are living on, you know, if we have to, the, what's most important is to awaken that inner life. Yes. To awaken the inner life. And then the outer life, it just comes naturally mm -hmm. as a result. It follows without having to do anything. So um, I think this is going to be a really great book to continue with. Thank you, Craig. Yeah. The Thanks. other one, Gerhard Adler's book, I think I began to see the progression, how the dream helped her and, you know, the interpretation, how, how it um, led her to progress, to evolve. And so maybe each of us could on our own if we want to continue to look at that. Yeah. But I'll, you just, I'll, you're going to do it yourself and then we can. Yeah. It'll be on YouTube. Is that right? Yes, I'll keep doing a little bit on, on her myself. Okay. By, the way. I, by the way, I just wanted to say how, how grateful I am to know all you guys. Uh, I Seriously, I just love hearing each one of you. I mean, I wish we, you, you, you know, if we didn't get bored. I, you know, we, it, these times go by so fast. But anyway, welcome, Susan. I'm so glad to see you and uh, and everybody else, Aline and Gary and Fabio and Diane, John, Tim, Kevin, Azeen, you and Ken Dream, Ava and Camilla, Dahlia. I love uh, seeing Dahlia again and Anjali. Uh, thank you, guys. We'll see you all next time. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.